as I typically do on my way to, to work. Uh, I was listening to the radio, and often on the radio, if you listen to it at all, you would know that there's often giveaways that they do throughout, uh, throughout the, the times that the hosts are talking. And one of the giveaways that they were uh, giving on the, on the radio this past week surprised me a little bit. The giveaway that they had was a free dinner that you could have with the radio hosts. Um, now, I was a little bit surprised when I heard this. I, this was not something that I would think for myself I would really want to do. I don't particularly want to have dinner with the, the radio hosts who present on this particular um, radio program. Um, my thought personally was if they could just ship me uh, dinner, if they could ship me a Chinese meal, that, that would be far more appealing to me. But there was one time for, for myself I saw, uh, when I was living on the Sunshine Coast, I actually saw uh, some people having dinner with radio hosts who won a, a giveaway similar to this. Um, I saw some people come, uh, come into a restaurant that Sarah and myself were, were eating at, and I recognised these people immediately. I recognised these people as some certain radio hosts from a Sunshine Coast radio station, and they were waiting there for some people. And then some people, these, this uh, couple came into the, into the restaurant, and straight away you could see that these people had won the giveaway, which was to win dinner with the radio host. They were welcomed in by the radio hosts, and it was very interesting watching the interaction that happened over the next little while. Although there was a lot of um, joy and happiness and excitement that happened right at the beginning of this dinner together, quickly the interaction became a little bit awkward between the radio hosts and these people. They didn't really have anything in common or anything in particular to talk about, but they had won this free giveaway which they needed to, uh, to take on, uh, which they needed to, to use. Now, when I was thinking about this this past week and I heard the, uh, that you could win dinner with some radio hosts and I thought back to this moment in time, one of the things that my mind automatically went to was the question that many of us have probably thought of at some stage in our life, if we could have dinner with anyone at all throughout history, who would that person be? Now, I've actually put in a lot of thought into this over this past week, but I'm going to give you just 30 seconds right now. If you could have dinner with anyone in history, who would it be? And there's one condition. The answer can't be Jesus, okay? That's the deal. I know what you lot are like. We're in a church here, and you would say the spiritual answer, okay? So the answer can't be Jesus. But right now, take 30 seconds and talk with someone nearby you right now. If you could have dinner with anyone throughout all of history, who would it be? Very good. My answer, I'll be the last one, but my answer for this was Moses. If I could meet anyone throughout history, it would be Moses. Once again, a very churchy sort of answer to give to this sort of thing. But I, after thinking about this, I'm going to get you to do this once again, but I'm going to flip the coin and I'm going to ask you the other side of the question. If there's anyone in all of history who you could think would be the worst person in history to have dinner with, who would that person be? Once again, take 30 seconds and uh, with the person next to you and answer that. My answer to this question was Genghis Khan. He killed roughly 11% of the world's population during his lifetime, and so I could think uh, pretty clearly that that would be someone that I wouldn't want to be having, uh, having dinner with. Now, none of us are ever going to be put in this position of having dinner with the person that we just named. I hope not, at least. Uh, but with all of these different situations, they may not seem fairly, uh, fairly realistic, but this last situation, I'm not going to get you to discuss this with one another, but this may be a little bit more familiar for many of you. I just want you to imagine right now that you are in a restaurant. You are going to be having a delicious three-course dinner over two hours, the most amazing dinner that you could ever have. There will be pork ribs and there will be... Um, smoked brisket, and if you are a vegetarian or a vegan, there'll be quinoa and things like that instead. 
But right now, if you were able to have this amazing meal laid out in front of you, and yet the person who you needed to have dinner with was the most awkward, difficult, annoying, challenging person that you've ever met, just think of that person right now and picture what that would be like to have dinner across from the most difficult person that you know in your life. Now, some of you would have been able to think of this person fairly quickly, and this image that you may uh, be seeing right now of having dinner for a long time, a bountiful feast across from the person who you might find most difficult in your life, this is actually the image which we seem to see a little bit of in Psalm 23. Now, over the past two weeks, we've been going through this series as we've been looking at Psalm 23, seeing God as the Good Shepherd. He is the shepherd of peace and he is the shepherd of protection. That's what we've seen in the first two weeks of this series. We've seen this in the first four verses, but then something seems to shift when we get to the part of uh, Psalm 23 that we're going to be looking at here this morning. There's only one paragraph break that happens within all of this psalm, and it happens in this place that we'll be looking at today. It happens between verses 4 and 5. Now, uh, verse 5 says something that we can often skip over and think of very quickly, and yet it sounds almost like the exact situation that I have placed before you just before. It sounds almost like the situation of being placed across from someone who is the most difficult, annoying, challenging person that you know, and being forced to have a two-hour, three-course meal with them. The first part of verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, many of us would have read this several times. But we probably don't stop often to think about what is actually being said here because it sounds very much like that situation I presented to you earlier on. Now, earlier on, there were images that we saw about uh, about being in, in green pastures and being led beside quiet waters, having a restored soul. Last week, Stephen spoke to us about being uh, led through the valley of the shadow of death and being protected by the rod and the staff of God. These are wonderful pictures and we would expect that this imagery would continue and yet something seems to change here in verse 5 that we come to because it says, you prepare a table before me. Lovely imagery, once again, a bountiful feast. But who is there in the presence of my enemies? This is not something that I would have expected to come through this psalm. And yet there's something profound that David is saying here in the first half of Psalm 23, verse 5. And the key in understanding what David is saying here comes actually from what Stephen spoke about last week. If you missed that message, I encourage you to, uh, to go and have a look at it. Um, because God is the good shepherd. He is a shepherd of protection, which was what we looked at last week. Um, But also the shepherd of protection is taken one step further through what we see here in uh, in the first half of verse 5. In the midst of walking through the valley of the shadow of death, in the midst of being surrounded on all sides by countless enemies, still there is God not only protecting us with his rod and his staff, but he is also there providing for us. He is giving to us. Yes, God fights for us, is on guard for us against attack, yet he is also giving us every single thing that we need to provide strength for us, even in the midst of being surrounded by enemies on all sides. Now, David, who wrote this, this would have been something that was very, very real for him. He constantly was under attack from people on all sides. Many of you would be familiar with the ways that Saul hunted David and he was on the run for years away from Saul. So being, having enemies was something that was very real for, uh, for King David who wrote this psalm. But for many of us today, we would probably not say, explicitly anyway, that we have any enemies 
I hope that none of us are at this stage at risk of having anyone wanting to kill us. So what do we do with a passage like this when it says being in the presence of enemies all around us? Although we may not have enemies in our lives or people who we class as enemies within our lives, all of us are going to come across people who either consciously or subconsciously seek harm against us. You may have people gossip against you. You may have people who slander against you. Someone might seek to damage your reputation. You might have people who seek to steal your money. They might lie about you. They may seek to steal your job. Now, people don't always realise that they are doing some of these things. People don't always realise that they are seeking harm against you. And yet, this is something that every single one of us If you have any interaction with people at all, we are likely to face in our lives. Many of you right now, you might be able to think of that person who is trying to bring harm against you. And yet this is a promise that we see here in Scripture that even when we are faced on all sides by people coming against us, even if every single person in the world is coming against us to harm us, we have a promise that God will provide every single thing that we need to be able to get through that. He will provide bountifully everything that we need to get through what we're going through in our life when people come against us. This is a key theme that we see not just here at the end of the psalm, but also presented right up the top because the psalm starts with these words. The Lord is my shepherd. What are the next words? I lack nothing. He provides. And this is the description of God as a provider that goes on in the second half of this verse in verse five because it says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. God here is described as a shepherd of provision who will give everything to his sheep that they need um, as he seeks to protect them. Now, both of these uh, images that we see here in the second half of verse 5, these are pictures of bountiful, overflowing prosperity that God, as a shepherd, is giving to his sheep. Oil is often associated with wealth um, uh, by people in Uh, in ancient times, and having a cup that is overflowing. Once again, this is a a picture of bountiful provision that God is giving to his people. One of the most most well-known names that God is given throughout Scripture that many of you would be familiar with is Yahweh Jireh, which is the Lord provides. And this is what we see here um, uh, shown and, uh, and many of you would have stories about how God has provided for you in miraculous ways. We even prayed in our prayer meeting earlier this morning, thank you God for providing through your people, through Commitment Sunday and the way that he has provided in that manner. Knowing this truth as, uh, of God as the great provider is a reassuring truth to many of us. And yet this is also something that I personally have struggled with over time, knowing God as a provider. Recently, there was a major event on our television, uh, television, something that many of you would have watched, and it was something that will happen probably uh, that we'll see only once in a generation. This is something that will be remembered for years to come. Does anyone know what I am referring to? Of course, I am referring to the eels versing the cowboys <laughs> on Friday night. Once in a lifetime moment where the eels made it into the grand final, God provided on that night. <laughs> he anoints my head with oil, my cup <laughs> overflows. <laughs> The eels will beat the Panthers. Please, Lord. (laughs) This was a very close game. This was the semi-final leading into the grand final. Um, And it was a very, very close game. And the time came to 63 minutes. And there was a key moment here where there was a penalty for the eels. And they decided to take the kick. 
for two points, and then it would have lined up the score in that moment. So they took the kick, and it was going straight. It was going right into the goalposts. And then at the last minute, it began to curve, and it missed. And so I prayed, Lord, please, please, we need some points very, very quickly to be able to, uh, to match this game up at the moment. 90 seconds later, there was a try from the Parramatta Eels. They converted the try. We had six points, not the two that we would have had. God provided in that moment as I prayed. Now, this is a light-hearted way to, uh, to describe the provision of, of God. And I assure you, I genuinely was praying on that night that God would provide what we, what we needed. And although I was praying for this, Calling God as a, as a provider is something that I've sometimes struggled with a little bit. Because in Australia, a lot of the time, our needs are actually met. Our needs are met so much of the time that we can spend time watching football games and asking for God to provide a few points on a footy match. There was an article that I read that came out earlier this week that said now... Australians are, on average, the richest people in the entire world today. As individuals, we have more wealth and assets than any other country in the world. So although it can be easy for us to say that God um, provides for us in, in this nation, I, I sometimes look at other nations who don't have the same things that we have and I find it a little bit more difficult to think of God as a provider when I see people who have no access to housing or education or even things that we find so basic as, as clean water. It can sometimes be hard to think of, a, as God, of God as a provider in, uh, in those situations. Now, in our physical nature, we often can simply perceive provision as physical provision. We can often think of the bountiful blessings of God as solely being physical things because those are things that are tangible, we can grab a hold of and we can see them. Yes, we do rely on God for our physical provision. We see in the Lord's Prayer that we are told daily to ask God to provide daily bread for us. But there is more to the provision of God. There is more to God being the shepherd of provision than just providing for our physical needs. All throughout Scripture, we see that God gives good gifts to His children and as a good shepherd, he provides every single thing that his sheep, us who are his sheep, everything that we need. And we are promised that constantly, not just here in Psalm 23 verse 5, but we are promised this all throughout Scripture. We are promised that the shepherd of provision will provide grace and mercy. He will provide salvation he provides direction. He provides wisdom. He provides life and power. He provides what we see in Philippians 4.19. He provides every single need that we have. God is the shepherd of provision, not just in a physical sense. Yes, he provides us our physical needs, but he provides so much more than that. Now, just based simply on what we see here spread all throughout all of Scripture, we could easily just say from that list that God is the good shepherd who provides for his people. But the real gift that God provides for his people are not just the gifts from him to us, but God provides himself as the ultimate gift for us, his sheep. The ultimate gift is God himself. The shepherd himself is where we find everything that we need. It's God himself who makes himself available for us to find complete joy and satisfaction in him. Because once again, we see the tone of um, of the final verse of this psalm change because David no longer speaks about God in metaphors like being a shepherd. 
He doesn't talk about him in descriptions anymore, but he brings clarity to what he's been saying this whole time throughout this psalm because he says, surely your goodness and your love, it will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's God himself who is good and loving. He provides himself to be the one who fulfills every need and desire in our lives. We know this because not too much earlier, when we go back a few chapters in Psalm 16, Dave writes, uh, David writes a very similar psalm to what we see here in Psalm 23. In Psalm 16, we see these words, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. Yes, God provides good things for his sheep as the good shepherd, but more than anything, the good shepherd provides himself for us that we might find joy and satisfaction fully in him. And I love the picture of this that comes to fruition in Psalm 23 because the picture is that God's goodness and love follows us. I just picture this when I walk through uh, the, the regular things I do on a daily basis. I almost picture that the goodness and love is following me. I can almost see God is uh, following me with his rod and his staff. He is protecting me. He is giving me what I need on a daily basis. He is never leaving me. He is defending me against everything that comes against me. And this is a message that many of us know. Many of us know that God is a provider. Many of us know that he is a good shepherd and that he provides himself for his people. And yet this is something I feel like we can so often forget. And the reason that we can so often forget about God being a good provider for us is because we have so much provided comparatively compared to the rest of the world, we have so much provided for us just based on where we live. So it can be very difficult for us to know God as a provider when we have so many of our physical needs met. And yet we know that he will provide those things in life that you need. For those who are needing grace and mercy, he will provide. For those who are needing salvation, he will provide. If you're needing direction or wisdom or life and power or any other need, God will provide. We see it because he is the good shepherd and because his love and goodness follows us all the days of our lives. And so this week, to remind us of the providing nature of our good shepherd, I'm going to ask you to do something this week which is to come before Psalm 23 and read it, not just how you would usually read it, but read it aloud. Read it slowly and allow the words to sink into your heart. And I would just love it if we can finish our time in this series together by doing this as his sheep, as God's people right now. And so as the team comes up, I'm just going to ask us to stand where we are and we're going to read Psalm 23 together. We're going to read this aloud and allow the words of this to remind us of the peace and the protection and the provision that our good shepherd gives to all of us. And so let's read this together right now. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me pray. Our good, kind, loving shepherd, we thank you for the promise of this psalm. The 
it's not simply words to give us reassurance in times of difficulty, but it is truth and it is a promise about who you really are. You are a shepherd who wants to bring peace to us. You're a shepherd who protects us. And you're a shepherd who provides for us. Right now, great Lord, we thank you that you provide yourself for us. That even in this moment, we have access fully to you. We can come before you with every need that we have. And we know that you will provide sometimes in ways that we won't expect or understand. But you are the God who provides for us. Lord, right now for anyone who is in need of any provision physically, Lord, I ask that you will provide. For anyone who is in need of any provision spiritually, Lord, provide. For any provision emotionally, Lord, provide. Lord, for anyone who is needing anything provided for them mentally, Lord, provide for them. We know that you're able to. You are Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides for us, your people. And we thank you that you provide yourself for us to encounter on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen.